Nemco Basbol Vanakerete. And welcome to Shift F1, a podcast about speedy race cars. That, by the way, if you couldn't tell, was Hungarian mm. for the fence is not made of sausage. Oh my goodness. Could you imagine? No dog would ever be captive, <laughs> captured again. Dogs would be free forever. Although, would they? Yeah. Maybe they would stay because of all the delicious sausages at their disposal. That's right. Uh, that is an idiomatic expression, meaning it's not as good as you think. Uh, and I hope for Ricardo's sake, he doesn't have high hopes for his first run in that Alpha Tauri. I am Drew Scanlon. Joining me, Danny O'Dwyer. How are you, Danny? I'm good. Does that mean, is that the Hungarian, the grass is always greener? Is that what that is then? I, I'm not sure I get it then, because I'm I'm still, yeah. I'm fixated on the imagery. A so, is it like, are we talking linked sausages? Is it is it like a bunch of Polish dogs where each each like rung of the fence is just one huge girthy sausage? No, it have to be links. I'm, you have to have links. Would it? I think so. Strapped together. Uh, maybe a mixture of maybe you know, who knows? You can. It's just faces and arse. You can make a sausage out of in any configuration. Truly, at a certain point, joining you us is to. Rob Zachney. <laughs> Uh, someone, How are you, Rob? Someone offered this up for the uh, Hungarian slang for today too. Uh, they were like, just in case you're, just in case you're hunting for for one. Uh, okay. Kapuzale van as ayad halien. Is there sauerkraut juice where your brain should be? I think that's. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> Not even sauerkraut. Sauerkraut juice. Yeah, Remnants. really, just really going for it there. I am getting. I skipped dinner, and this is not helping. Well, let's yeah. get on with it. If you're new to this sauerkraut podcast, juice to me, I just lose it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to dip my sausages in some sauerkraut juice, if you know what I'm saying. There is a theme here. Uh, <laughs> if you're new to Formula One itself, we recommend listening to our preseason primer episode, which assumes no prior F1 knowledge and explains how the sport works and who everybody is. So if you'd like to go back and listen to that, it's episode 216. Also, this show is supported entirely by our audience over at patreon.com slash shift F1, where every month we release bonus podcasts and videos exclusively for our patrons that cover racing documentaries and films, F1 video games, experiments with other racing series, and a lot of weird things. So if you would like to support the show and get access to all that fun stuff, head over to patreon.com slash shift F1 or click the link in the show notes. What do we have going on this month, Danny? Next week, early next week, we'll be, co- re- be recording our review of Need for Speed. Uh, so look out for that in your inboxes and your patron feed, all Shift F1 patrons. And massive thanks to all of our incredible title sponsors, Aaron Collitz, Cyphus Training, Turf SES, Alex Medina, Kick a Hat of the Art, at Team Blackjack, Michael Mabes, Gordy's Army, at Talking Autos, Olivia Evans, Ironstation.dev, TelemetryDeck.com, FTC, Drew Stewart, Bailey Foot, Abdullah Althani, Jason Chadwick, Back to normal there. Abraham Getchell, The Space Above Us Podcast, Bunny Fiend, Snigs, Alex Goucher, Max Faltar, Circuit Demon, Troy Stammer, Umberto Roca, William Romf, Irvine, Clinical Research, Lachlan the Madden Man, and Jason Kelly. Thank you all for your continued support during this terrific F1 time. Almost time for the summer break, but not quite yet, Drew, right? We got a few races left here. We certainly do. Uh, And before we uh, chat about the upcoming Hungarian Grand Prix, we do have some news stories here. It's kind of a light week. Hmm. Uh, I feel like the the big last week. (laughs) Pretty much. Yeah. Everybody else got out of the way. Donnie Rick. Yeah. Um, A lot of good headlines. Not a lot of uh, meat on the bone. No, I think that the biggest, you know, sort of thing that I found, um, uh, and it's, it's, it, it didn't even make our show, but I'm going to talk about it anyway, <laughs> uh, is that, um, let's see, I'm just going to open it here. Go for just it. Do some on the, on the fly news and uh, while we're talking about Danny Rick, Jonathan Noble over at uh, Autosport has an article, and I think a lot of other people have pointed this out here, uh, that I'll, so one thing that Ricardo himself highlighted uh, I think on the Beyond the Grid podcast uh, from Formula One um, about why he was having trouble with the McLaren. Right. Um, was the corner entry. Uh, I'm just going to quote from the article here. Uh, if the car he is, dri- Ricardo, is driving does not give him confidence on corner entry, things can quickly spiral out of control, quoting Ricardo. Uh, it all starts there. If you struggle with a corner on the exit, normally it's a product of what's happened through the corner. That's put you in a position of, let's say, difficulty on the exit. Most difficulties start on the entry. Maybe not all, but most. 
Uh, and uh, Noble goes on to point out that the Alpha Tauri is basically that. Right. So uh, that's maybe why we should maybe temper our expectations, uh, at least early on. Um, we d- we d- another thing that they kind of sorry go ahead Dan. no no we d- uh, we did sort of cover a lot of the Daniel Ricardo stuff last week but um it was interesting to hear uh, the backroom chatter that he was sort of wanting to wait until next year half maybe because to get a bit of training under his belt but also mostly because the direction of the car sort of amalgamating a little bit closer to the Red Bull philosophy um was something that he was looking forward to. Danny Ricardo is like, I think it, it can come across as a weakness maybe because we have seen him so many times come in with all this optimism and then ultimately, you know, the new card, the new team, whatever it is, doesn't pan out. But he does seem to always have that optimism. You know what I mean? Like at least at the start, like he does try and carry it through. And even when he's going through bad phases, it seems, at least on the outside, maybe he's just really good at like hiding his true emotions, but it seems like he is good at keeping his head and at least continuing to try. Uh, that said, though, you know, he's not going to get much of a, a grilling for the first couple of races. He has to get used to driving the car and all that. So we'll have a couple of races under his belt before the, the mid-season break. But for his sake, I think all he has to do is drive that car within its window of performance um, and he'll be fine going into next year. The thing I think he doesn't want to happen is that he has an absolute mare with that car. Sonoda is, is still able to wrangle it more than he can. Um, and then he's he's frazzled by the time they're getting into next season. Um, I, I feel like all of us collectively like Daniel Ricciardo, so maybe we're a little softer on him. But also I think the limitations of that car are a large part of the reason why most of us are saying that Nick DeFries also got short shift. Because... Yeah, it, it, you know, it's the car is not good. Yeah, uh, one other thing I think that it, it, it might be different this time is that um, one of these other articles pointed out that when Ricardo went back to Red Bull and uh, got in the simulator, Christian Horner said something like, "It was really not the Ricardo we remember," mm. um, because he had I don't know learned some bad habits or I something. Was, uh, I, but and, I but, was and, so but it took. You you don't believe you Christian? So? Is that Christian? I'll just telling a yeah, story? yeah. I'll just finish yeah, this on. off because he they say like he it took him a while, but eventually he returned to form. Right. So if that's true, I think he can maybe hang his hat on that. And so even if things go south with this year's Alpha Tower, he can say like, well, you know, we kind of expected that. Um, but you know, I think another thing here is that we don't hear the driver team communication, and I think that is a big part of what the driver's role is. Right. So if you uh, have a driver that can't really give you that feedback in the way that you need to, you know, uh, increase performance on the car. That's also a big red flag. And if Red Bull are bringing Daniel Ricciardo back into the fold, they clearly have confidence in that part of it. And, and if nothing else, he will be better at that than Nick DeVries. And that's not saying anything, you know, I'm not criticizing Nick DeVries on that, but he's not a rookie, but he was a rookie in F1. And he doesn't understand the cars as well as somebody like Daniel Ricardo. Ricardo's knowledge of all those people, right? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. And Ricardo's also worked at many teams now. So in many ways, he has actually more accumulated knowledge than most of the drivers on the grid, you know, yeah. say for like, you know, Hamilton and Alonso and some folks who have been around um, as well. And I think that type of thing is, can be useful um, for teams like, especially more so AlphaTauri than Red Bull, you know what I mean? Who, who really do need to find that edge and, and be able to uh, diagnose problems faster, um, you know, yeah. in that mid- mid-season or that mid-pack battle. Yeah, and I think someone with Ricardo's experience, I think, you know, can act as a really uh, a, a key uh, differentiator there. Um, well, that's kind of the, the only real... F1 news there is got some kind of fun some fun ones here that we pulled I always like talking about graphics TV graphics and the new things that they're trying Uh, they put um, well I guess all drivers in Formula 1 and probably Formula 2 have uh, biometric telemetry that is beamed um, well I'm I'm not sure I don't know that it's beamed to the teams but I think the medical team at least has access to it Oh, so that they can tell in the event of a crash um, you know, how many G's did a driver sustain? What's their heart rate? Uh, what's going on before they even get to the car? They know that, you know, about the driver's condition. Um, it was instituted a few years ago and 
as soon as they did, I was like, well, now let's start broadcasting it because, you know, they do it in MotoGP um, or they have. I'm not sure that they still do. I've been watching. Um, but they trialed it in Formula 2 recently. Um, they showed, let's see, who was it? Um, I believe it was Frederick Vesti. Vesti, yeah. Yes. Um, he says, I watched 10 seconds of the race where I saw my heart rate going up while I was doing an overtake. I think that's a pretty cool thing. <laughs> Uh, I agree with you, Frederick. Uh, However, there is some consternation, of course, in Formula One Mm. uh, with the theory, maybe, that it might be used for, um, you know, uh, against a team, you know, for by by an opposing team as uh, some sort of competitive advantage. Uh, I assume that the worry would be that, oh, they see that, uh, you know, Everything looks fine on our car, but the driver's heart rate is actually skyrocketing. So this must be something wrong or he's getting ready to overtake or something like that. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I think this might just be like an ego thing. Like drivers wouldn't want to know, they wouldn't want people to know how like, not cold uh, as scared ice they, they are. Not scared, but like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I'm the ice man out there and like, boom, 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 <laughs> boom. Yeah. <laughs> like I thought, I figured the fear would have been that like live telemetry in case of an accident, you see like severe bodily harm inflicted or something like somehow live. Right. Uh, that 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 would have been the concern. The fact that the concern is over a uh, like you know lie to me situation effectively. Do you remember that? Sorry, do you remember that TV series Lie to Me? Uh, the, oh my uh, god, I do. Um, Why do I remember that? Yeah, so, that t- so this was found. So there was this wildly overstated researcher uh, on like lie detection. The, the you know, okay, got yeah. a lot of press around it, and as is often the case with these things, it doesn't hold up under scrutiny in the intervening years. But it, the hype lasted long enough to create a series called Lie to Me, starring Tim Roth, where he runs effectively. It was another. You know, genius detective teaming with the FBI is basically Bones, but like harder core. Really fun show, not going to lie. But the whole notion was he was just so good at spotting deception that like all the little tells that people can't control, oh. blush response, heart rates, like whatever you try to do. With like can, zoom in or can, something, would it? Like, yeah, you like can the totally hair divine. standing up or. <laughs> what are you trying to conceal from us? And so the notion that a heart rate monitor would somehow <laughs> give teams insight into uh, like other 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 rate like race craft or the true state of the car is so funny to me it is a little bit like um you know we can sort of project onto that stuff very easily you know like i don't know i'm not a i'm not a doctor i don't you know i i I imagine that heart rate goes up in specific either stressful or physically exerting situations but like i don't really know how hearts work and i don't really know the second by second the 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 one area i think that it could be used that people wouldn't like is for instance in the let's use uh the hamilton verstappen crash at silverstone last year as like a or two years ago as like a mm. an example where then people are like oh look hamilton's heart rate or who verstappen's heart rate this went is where up tried to a kill him here yeah or yeah this is this is like Right here, Hamilton, Hamilton had a rush of blood to the head. You know what I mean? Like that type of thing to sort of, you know, to tell the story around it or retcon reality or something like that. Um, I, I also, honestly, I like the graphic, but like it honestly doesn't add much to me. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, they're probably a little bit more stressed doing that thing. <laughs> You know? Oh no! I what? I just I I want to see it on uh before the lights go out. That's okay. That is. Know? I was just and thinking, it, and I want to see a graph. No, AWS. I yes. I was just think. I was thinking the same thing. I want it on the formation lap. I want to see. Oh, yeah. Yuki Sonoda, how he's doing at Monaco. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would have loved to see Latifi at the start of every race. Um, yeah. I think. Uh, or, or like maybe. A situation where, like, you know, when Lando was winning before he he spun out in the rain, like in Russia, like a like yeah. somebody who's right on the limit, maybe you know that would be a fun thing. Qualifying, to see. oh qualifying. yeah, sure, qualifying, yeah, I could see that. Okay, I want to see the uh, just to game it out a little more. Yeah, that's <laughs> yes. fair. Yes. Oh, that's a good one. The team principal. Team principals. Toto's heart. Safety race. car. <laughs> safety car. Safety car. And like Red Bull, everyone just like flatlining effectively, and then over a Ferrari, just like all over the place. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
Uh, I do think that you would have to, you have to uh, grade on a curve because everyone's heart rate is different. I think Neil Armstrong had like a abnormally high heart rate. Oh, so like funny. They thought that things were going wrong and they were just like, no, no he's, he's fine. That's just how he is. Uh, so you would have to like, you know, um, average it for each person and then have like a, a meter, right? Uh, cause the, the number may not necessarily, but you should have the number two. Cause then you could be like, wait a minute. I, I just ran like, you know, four miles and my heart rate got up to, you know, um, that high. And they're like, uh, you know, that that's their average or some, you know, something crazy like that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I say we try it. I love weird experiments like that. Just do loads to put their blood type up there, put their, you know, yeah. put their, Bladder level. Oh, you yeah. old fighting game. <laughs> Legit bladder letter. <laughs> one yeah. type O. <laughs> yeah. Uh, why don't we give ranks at the end? I guess we sort of do, but they don't go to S. Yeah, mm. Actually, be, yeah, true. you know what? Done with that driver of the day. We need to know who was like S tier. Yeah. So give, show us your social links with your team. <laughs> uh, all right, Danny, what's the next one? Here Brad Pitt, yeah. The, uh, yeah. So, um, Speaking of heartthrobs. So, oh, yeah, absolutely. Not, not coming to a screen near you anytime soon, though. Uh, the Brad Pitt, the soon, the as yet untitled Brad Pitt Formula One movie um, has been halted. The production of it has been halted uh, due to a knock-on effect of the writer's strike. Obviously, the writer's strike kicked off back in May. Uh, recently, SAG-AFRA, which is the biggest union of uh, actors in the states here i think they have something crazy like a hundred thousand members or was, i think it was uh, I, th- I should re-look that up i think it was yeah, yeah hundred thousand yeah, hundred thousand requirements are weird too uh so they right, tend yes. to like have inflated numbers because you do any bit of acting uh like this is the one that famously i think bobby kodak is a member of because i mean he, he had a speaking role in moneyball let's let's that's that's some act that's more acting than most people um he got to sit there with his little Shit eating smile <laughs> of <over> Brad Pitt. <laughs> Speaking of Brad Pitt, what a, um, what a strange thing. But yes, if you were watching a lot of the sort of extracurricular video around Silverstone, you would have been uh, more aware of this movie than most weeks because they were actually filming there. Uh, the hypothetical F1 team APX GP. Uh, not only did they have a fake um, uh, uh, garage at the bottom of the pit, they had fake. Uh, pit crews there they had brad pitt and his co-stars like face and their like fake driver names above um uh, the garages too and also right before the formation lap they actually had both cars at the back of the grid and did some filming um to basically insert some of this stuff uh at silverstone into the final movie uh, however it has now been halted because uh, sag is involved uh, brad pitt is a member of sag and i'm sure many other people as part of the uh, production are too so uh yes much like everything that's hitting in the movies and television that's produced in america and um, it's going to be delayed and how long it's delayed is largely up to a bunch of rich jerks <laughs> who own a lot of these studios so we'll have to wait and see uh, there was an article in, in Racer um, that uh, has some quotes from from Pitt about, and I believe it's Lewis Hamilton produced? He's yes, a producer yeah. he's a producer on it, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, wants to make sure that it is a very uh, realistic Formula One movie. Uh, did you mention their their Formula Two cars that are? Made oh yeah, sorry, I, I did offline. Yes, they they have sort of modified F two cars, and and the actors are driving them. Apparently, I don't mm-hmm. know. At least Pitt is. Pitt, yeah, which is pretty cool. So they must be quite modified, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, uh, apparently, so his his character's name, Sunny Hayes. Oh, I like it. Pretty good racer name. It's like a good IPA name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so he, in this article, describes a little more about the uh, the plot of the film, which they've been kind of cagey about. Again, we don't know the name yet. Apparently, Pitt's character like has a horrible crash. Yes, um, he comes back. Uh, he's out of retirement. He was a sort of right. He he is racing in other disciplines. His friend, played by Javier Bardem, Ooh. is a team owner. Uh, they're a last placed. Uh, a team 22 20 21 22 on the grid they've never scored a point they have a young phenom played by damson idris he brings me in as kind of a hail damn mary. son 
Idris. <laughs> D-A-M-S-O-N. Okay, that's pretty good. Damson Idris, I guess. Uh, and he says, uh, he brings me in as... This is Pitt talking. Uh, Javier Dem, I guess. Javier Bardem, I guess. Uh, brings him in as kind of a Hail Mary and, quote, hijinks ensue. Hijinks. Ooh, Formula One hijinks. They should call it that. Uh, Formula One hijinks. Yeah. You're going for a hijinks <laughs> you got to get a better ride. pitch man than Brad Pitt, I guess. <laughs> hijinks. <laughs> hijinks. It's like Keystone Cops. They go, yeah, so this movie would be funny? Like, I don't know. I'm sure it was just him. Just saying a thing because he was asked about the movie for the five millionth time. Um, yeah, I, I, who knows? I don't, I, I'm, I don't know about this movie, but I guess we'll wait and see. Which team is that mostly like? It does sound a little bit like uh, the situation with um, with Alonzo coming in to babysit oh, Williams, Stroll. Maybe I guess I don't know, like 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 a team that has forever been crap. Never even had a sniff of like real success to me. That's Sauber vibe. HRT because not mm-hmm. like a beloved Williams thing, but just a you've always been one of the bottom feeders, never really made any inroads. Yeah, I bet like, there's a team in the like eighties that is exactly this that like were total bottom feeders and then oh, did Jordan. that. And <laughs> yeah, but Jordan had a couple of podiums, right? I feel like they were only after Javier Bardem brought in Brad Pitt. <laughs> Colini apparently or Coloni ranked uh, the most uh, did not qualify or did not participate ever in the last three years of existence. They entered 46 Grand Prix and did not finish one of them in their last two years. Oh, they did not oh, even wow. qualify for any races. <laughs> back, wow. Back when they used to do That's that. That's true. We, we tend to forget the like qualifying means qualifying. Yeah. Uh, era, uh-huh. Where you could have a team where it's like, Maybe this time we'll make the grid. No. No. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's a lot of bad uh, teams. Well, s- speaking of not making the grid, Rob, let's check in with our friend, Nicholas. Yeah. Uh, so Nicholas Latifi made an announcement. Uh, for those of you who were hashtag on, on, on hashtag Latifi watch, uh, <laughs> your watch has ended <laughs> uh, because he has decided after a year of sort of figuring out what to do uh, that... You know what makes sense if you're a rich guy uh, who's sort of at loose ends after your racing career doesn't pan out? Going for that business degree. Ooh. Uh, yeah, so, so, he is, so, so he is pursuing an MBA, uh, and he has not ruled out going, he, he's not ruled out returning to racing in some way, shape, or form, uh, but for the moment, he has been accepted uh, to the London Business School's uh, MBA program, so that is that is where he is headed, and he is uh, you know just going to just going to see what's out there. I've seen some folks talking about maybe he wants to move to the other side of the garage, effectively, uh, right? You know, down down the road, if he wants to stay stay in racing. I mean, I could just see him becoming a pancake magnate. This is the thing. Like his his family is like a huge, uh, like, what, it's like a foodstuffs empire, but like particularly mm. like um, poutine. Is it? No, like isn't Nutella literally his family's company? Is it? Is it really? It's a shame well, he's not like, called Nicholas Nutella. That would be way better. N- Nutella, like I, I feel like they they are now owned by a company like, uh, the Ferrero. Live Googling, folks. I'm going to be very upset if Nicholas Latifi's family got their money from Nutella and we didn't get like four years of nut jokes that we got to use against him. Mm. Or Nut- Nutella, I guess, as it's he known did over here. T- but there were a lot of promos on social media with him talking into bre- like pancakes. Talking into like, pancakes? No, talking into. Talk, oh, talk, oh, talk. Not talking into. <laughs> talk. Now that would have been something. Now that would now talk. hang on. That would have gotten my attention. If like Nicholas Latifi's just doing the weirdest fucking spawn con for just his family's business. Push, where, pushing a pancake up to his face and talking into it. Like, like just Terry Gilliam esque surrealism just unfolding on Instagram like every week. Talking into. So you mean eating. Eating yeah. pancakes. Okay. Maybe he's I don't know. 2020 when did he finish was 2022 his last season was he around last am i crazy uh last year he, or was his was he was right because this last... is logan Sargent's rookie year 
So he yes. was around last year. He was. I don't remember anything that happens after 2021 to that kid. <laughs> Honestly, know. which and do you know why? I remember everyone's like, stop sending Nicholas Latifi death threats. Death threats. And yes. then he dematerialized. That's lit- literally, I wonder, did he completely disappear off all like news and social media? And did he like, did he, um, who are, who are the like people they hired celebrities, like publicists? Did he like, just like tell his publicists just to keep him out of the news? Because... Everyone was sending him death threats because they thought that he intentionally crashed so that Lewis Hamilton wouldn't win the championship. Which is a very. I don't think I'm, they thought he intentionally did. I think people were just mad that he, you know. It's just bad. Yeah, just that he had the temerity to crash and cause crash, that, that. Crash that in a part of the track I cannot remember anyone ever crashing. Well, <laughs> it was rough out there. Yeah, under the hotel. A what a weird spot. He is, yeah. Miss him. Miss you, Nick. Well, I've missed the Hungara Ring, Danny. Tell me about it. I have too. The Hungara Ring has been around almost as long as I have. Around the same. It was uh, it was uh, founded. Actually, it broke ground in 1985, but they had their first race there in 1986. They toyed around. Uh, Hungary was really like, um, th- this was a big deal for them, getting this, uh, this, this track done, and they almost had a track that was quite in, like inside Budapest um that uh that was going to be upgraded but instead they opted to build this one instead it's about 20 kilometers from Budapest um out inside the out in the countryside quite a warm part of a country that can get warm on a good day anyway apparently it's right beside a water park so it's uh in uh, in generally a, a pretty um hot place and this is a hot time of year to be going there and Hungary is generally pretty hot as a result uh it's a 70 lap race these are short laps and there's barely a straight to be seen they have the mandatory straight at the start finish so that the cars can line up and be in an in order but aside from that it is a little go-kart track hungar ring is 4.4 kilometers about 2.7 miles not only is there a lot of these low and medium speed corners but I would say almost all of them have some type of either uphill or downhill to them. Um, some of them have some pretty like interesting off-camber turns to them. Um, and because of the amount of low speed and medium speed turns, along with the sort of general shortness of the track... It you you end up using like Monaco levels of downforce here on the setup, like super high downforce cars to make sure that they can have that mechanical grip required to take these turns uh, at the speeds as as well as that because of this sort of like you know higher braking zone lower speed turns and the track is also fairly wide when you're battling there are lots of different um angles you can take both in and out of lots of these corners so uh, because of that you just need to have a car that can kind of can take it can take it when you need to like you know approach this corner differently or exit it differently defend hard and all that sort of stuff so all of that sort of combines to generally make this like a kind of a fun track there's overtakes in lots of different spots like people try overtakes in weird spots here um and uh it's you know with the heat as well the sort of natural bowl that the uh that the the track is in it's sort of also like just it's not like Austria where it's like hot but windy. It's here it's kind of like hot and stagnant and you just get like this increasing uh, track temp as well on the ground. So because of all that it it it's a bit of a it's not an easy drive this one. It's a fun one I think for a lot of the uh, drivers, but there's plenty of places here, plenty of tricky turns. Turn 12 um comes to mind right before the uh uh the the, the little sort of slow part into the start finish straight. Um, turn seven and six, uh, loads of really cool parts. So yeah, I think it'll be fun. Drivers tend to like it, and uh, we've had some funny results here in the past as a result of some of this, uh, some of the um, interesting things that can happen here. Well, Danny, you're right about the hotness. Uh, Eighty degrees on qualifying day, climbing to eighty four uh, on race day. That is um, twenty seven degrees Celsius and twenty nine respectively. Yes, Europe also uh, precipitation... suffering a heat wave, not just uh, ah. uh, the states. Yes, pretty bad. Italy at the moment, anywhere down near the Mediterranean, is having a really hard time. So that might be part of it as well. 
Right. Uh, small chance of rain for each session, 10% on qualifying day, 20% on uh, race day, and um, some light uh, winds, 10 miles an hour um, or 16 kilometers an hour, uh, similar on um, qualifying and race day. Um, all right. Well, as we head into Hungary, the driver standings look like this. Max Verstappen is in first place with 255 points. Sergio Perez in second uh, with 156 Fernando Alonso is in third with 137. Lewis Hamilton in fourth with 121. And then Carlos Sainz in fifth with 83. Uh, right behind him, George Russell with 82. Then Charles Leclerc with 74. Lance Stroll in eighth with 44. Lando Norris with 42. Esteban Ocon in 10th with 31. Then we've got Piastri with 17. Gasly with 16. Albon with 11. Hulkenberg with 9. Valtteri Bottas in 15th place with 5 points followed by Joe with four, Sonoda and Magnuson tied with two, Logan Sargent and Nick DeVries with zero. In the constructor standings, Red Bull Racing is on top with 411 points. Oof. In second place, Mercedes with 203. That is less than half of Red Bull. <laughs> uh, Aston Martin's in third with 181, Ferrari's in fourth with 157, then a jump down to Mercedes uh, I'm sorry, McLaren Mercedes now in fifth place with 59 points. Alpine has got 47. Williams and Ginas and team tied with 11 points. Uh, Alfa Romeo is in ninth with nine and Alfa Tauri in 10th with two. Uh, one Williams little thing to seven. point out. Uh, sorry, up at the top. Um, uh, one longstanding record, I believe it was set in the, I want to say the 70s is if Red Bull win this weekend, they will have uh, 12 wins in a row, which has not been broken since, I, I'm pretty sure, seven, like something crazy, like 71, McLaren holds it. Um, so even during that all those... That is surprising to me. Yeah, all those Mercedes dominant years, and there was just year, there was weekends where they just didn't, they either crashed Is that why or, this feels different to me? Like, is they, it just recency bias, or is it different? I, I was also equally shocked by that. It might just be the thing where they had a bad race on the 11th race a lot. You know what I mean? Or the 10th race. Right. But, um, so in, in 24 races, they won 23. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah, so at Silverstone, the Red Bull team managed to equal McLaren. And if they win this uh, weekend, yes, it'll be the first time in something between 40 and 50 years since uh, we've had 12 in a row. So... Yeah, Historic. I was equally shocked. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not. It's uh, not a track that necessarily also suits them. I'll say that. It, you know, straight line speed in hunger in Hungary can only get you so far. Danny, are you calling it? I'm not. I'm. I'm saying now. I'm not calling it. <laughs> Actually, what I will say is this is going to be a genuine test of the McLaren setup because mm. Silverstone and the previous. What was the previous race? It was um. Uh, Austria um, are both tracks with decent straights on them that seem to benefit um, McLaren too, and I this is this is a track that is in the complete opposite direction. So if if Mc, I, I won't say if McLaren does perform well here, then they've really got a good car. I think is is the way to look up, look at that, and Ferrari should do well here as well because they they tend to like that. The color of paprika. We'll uh, well, if you would like to join the standings paprika? yourself, you should watch that. What is there an anime? <laughs> the anime paprika. paprika. Mm. Yeah, it's terrific. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you would like to join the standings yourselves, you can join our fantasy league using the link in the show notes, and you can also send us an email. Shiftfmpodcast at gmail .com. Rob, what are some emails that we've received? What are some emails? We got a lot of emails, uh, starting off with Nicholas here. Hi there, boys. I just attended the Montreal F1 race and would like to contribute a hack to get paid to attend an F1 race. What? Hint, it has to do with F1 Net Zero 2030. <laughs> Step one, buy a grandstand ticket for you and your 12-year-old child. The child is important. <laughs> Oh, uh, where are we going with this, Nicholas? <laughs> yeah, what? Step two. You read this beforehand, the right? each day, notice the hundreds of commemorative reusable liquor cups left behind. <laughs> okay, I see this now. Yeah. Step three. I've, have I've been to a festival. Easter egg hunt and collect the cups. <laughs> Step four. Return the cups to the nearest liquor tent and receive 
Two dollars per cup. No. Wow. What? Wild things happening with Canadian currency. Oh my god. Step five. Rejoice and repeat until the logjam of fans is cleared so you can leave. The that liquor is... vendor folks were quite amused at the sight of a child carrying 100 stacked cups <laughs> to them over and over. <laughs> they were more than happy to give him his refund, and the security guards let my son up into the grandstands long after they were closed off. We easily netted $600 no. per day. Per day? Across three days. Despite our oh, best efforts, my God. there were many cups left over, never mind the other grandstands. And no, I did not take a cut like a <gasps> mob boss. My son is now glee it, my son is now <laughs> gleaming orange in overpriced McLaren merch <laughs> with a belly full of poutine and ice cream and a wallet full of cash. Oh my wow. God. Are you kidding? I feel like th that's incredible. Hey, you know what? I bet it's cheaper than hiring people to do the job per hour is just getting getting child labor to, to, <laughs> <laughs> that's incredible two bucks per cup that is unreal that's crazy. wow that's crazy well secrets out now nicholas i gotta get me some of those kids get a couple of trials my <laughs> my daughter's well, like five does that mean like these spares just being like are these gonna all be hitting ebay in like five minutes uh where it's like you want to you want a commemorative right. 2023 Canadian GP cup? I would. I bet it's one of these things where, like, the only way they sell you the... It's like at a ballpark where they sell oh, you yeah. the drink, but the drink mm. costs $15. But, hey, you get a commemorative cup where you get to take home the nacho bowl because it's a hash. Uh, but really, it's just that they want to sell you nachos for 20 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Man, that is amazing. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, will I take this next one? Yeah. All right, this one's from AC, which could be air conditioning, Assassin's Creed, the limitless possibilities. AC writes, super interesting point you raised in last week's episode about the cost cap affecting salaries and the career development of staff on the teams. I've lately been wondering why the cost cap is imposed on personnel. At the beginning of cost cap talks, it made sense that the cap included absolutely everything. But now, as like you said, the season is a million years yet long, Personnel are being kept away from their families for months on end, and the spending doesn't seem to be slowing the bigger teams. See down, uh, sorry, teams down, slowing the bigger teams down. See Red Bull Gate. But now I'm thinking, why don't the FAI cap only the expenditure on parts and actual additional labor? Employ as many people as you need, pay them properly, and allow them reasonable promotional opportunities, but disallow expenditure on things like overtime, and I don't know if any teams do this, uh, but temporary con slash contract workers for short-term development projects. This would mean there's no wage cap for permanent full-time staff, but the bigger teams who could afford to bring people in uh, on a short-term basis and pay overtime wouldn't be allowed to do so. The cost cap would still be applied to parts so that even if a large crew of highly skilled engineers devised an improvement, they would still be on a, a level with the smaller teams because the, r the rationing of money would still come into play. Maybe this me would mean a lower cost cap? Are the logistics I'm overlooking... Um, are there logistics I'm overlooking that mean this wouldn't work? That one comes in from AC. Um, I'm interested in what Rob has to say about this. My initial worry is that the amount at which teams could af healthily afford to just have really stacked decks of full-time employees um, that wouldn't necessitate them needing to do this whole temporary contract worker thing. Like, especially, I think, and I'm sort of looking at soccer a little bit here, and interestingly, what me and Rob and Patrick were talking about last week on um, uh, their podcast was what happens if in a couple of years' time we see a sort of unlimited bucket owner come in? You know what I mean? Like, what happens if the Saudi Public Investment Fund buys an F1 team and then suddenly they can employ as many people as they want? Well, they will. <laughs> they will employ a lot of people. Uh, what do you make of Rob? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you brought that up because this was because uh, I, I kind of wanted your take on it as someone who follows football. Uh, because yeah, immediately my thought is where this falls apart is if part of the if part of the goal of the cost cap is to make it so that there's less of a nonstop spending war, then 
teams are just going to hoover up all the talent they possibly can, right? Like, there's going to be people you can't get because, like, better to be slightly less paid at a second-tier team rather than be, you know, an understudy to an ageless Adrian Newey and never getting to, like, design a car. (laughs) But I, I think for the most part, you would see these sorts of, like, brain trust operations just, like, absorb a ton of the talent and also just jack up the price so much that, like... Uh, you know, smaller teams can't really compete with that. And if your goal is uh, sustainability for smaller teams or, uh, you know, better better competition, then that's at odds with that. But, you know, obviously you could work around that with, with instituting costs for like, te- like cost caps maybe for some technical staff. I don't know, do something to try and mitigate it uh, so that like wages aren't being the area that teams can most easily easily cut back on but the other thing i sort of found myself wondering about and this is sort of throwing back to you danny is like you know past the level of like the people you think about with like a with like a soccer team right like the the players the you know the 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 coach and and his assistants is there benefit like you know you can always get better physical training staff better nutritional yep. staff better facilities better cooks better chefs better uh you know like you know across the board you can always have like people who are better or at least seem better at the thing that they do that isn't directly you know you can't draw a line on it so like this is what's happening on the field but i'm curious like when we talk about you know the the juggernauts of premier league or or uh you know the the european leagues do any of them have a reputation for being like, yeah, we we spring for the stars, and then we spring for the like catering staff? And yeah. does it feel like that matters? <laughs> well, it's funny you bring up catering staff given Red Bull Gate, Red but Bull. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I think you're you're completely right, and I think what's happened actually in recent years with the sort of changing face of media and clubs doing a little bit more of this stuff, and also you know opening the door a little bit wider is that we're getting increasingly aware of all of that um, social infrastructure that exists around clubs. I think there are two things in soccer, and we're sort of in transfer mode at the moment in the Premier League, which is why this is a little bit top of mind, Um, especially as an Arsenal fan, we just signed Declan Rice and he, you know, most expensive uh, player in English football history, 105 million uh, pounds spent on him. Um, by uh, our team Arsenal, who generally have have not spent that type of money in the league, um, and there there are two sort of aspects that come up a lot um, when it comes to why players move or why people go places. Uh, one is the city; it makes a really big difference. People are having long careers at these clubs. Uh, a lot of players in soccer, especially, m- tend to get in relationships younger and have kids on the younger side. So being in a place where it works for their whole family is a big deal. This comes up a lot with international moves. Um, It's why the Saudi league is having trouble getting some folks out there too. It's why Messi didn't go because his family didn't want to go and that's why he's in Miami. Um, But as you rightly said, one of the biggest uh, hidden sort of, um, you know, power moves that some of these clubs have is the infrastructure around the club. That can be the training facilities. It can be the like you said it can be the canteen folks but it can easily be the trainers the coaches the uh physical therapists that are on site all that type of stuff um newcastle recently has had like a massive injection of funds and while they haven't spent a lot of money on new players they've spent a lot of money on facilities and they've spent a lot of money on the infrastructure around the club and all of that stuff can make a massive difference um not just for like you know you spend more money you get the best talent but also just for the general sort of um what would you say like culture of a club like that excellence breeds excellence that yeah. type of thing so when i look at some of um you know the teams honestly the sort of funnel that exists in soccer at the moment in football is it's quite wide in terms of the personnel available. Uh, when you look at like specific players, Declan Rice, for instance, if Arsenal hadn't gotten Declan Rice, there's probably not another Declan Rice in the league for us to get and we'd be in trouble. When you look at like coaches, for instance, the level of coaching in soccer is way higher than it was 10, 20 years ago because the infrastructure around it is built. Um, 
but there are specific roles within it like for instance directors of football like when man city had this big you know man city are like one of the biggest clubs you know in the world right now absolutely dominated the the premier league they were a nothing club my entire life growing up until they had all this injection of uh middle eastern money but what they did right away is they hired shed loads of people from Barcelona's backroom. All of these like people who were responsible for mm. financing, for hiring, for uh, scouting, for setting up the club. And they have bred this amazing excellence at that club. And you can compare them to a team like Chelsea, which has also spent a shed load of money, but did it in the stupidest way possible and have just wasted years and years and years of Roman Abramovich's money and now this other crowd's money doing nothing with, you know, this massive advantage they had. Sorry, Chelsea fans. I'm an Arsenal fan. That's, you know, take it with a pinch of salt. (laughs) So when I look at F1, though, one of the things that worries me is that in soccer, you have this ability to get this wide pool of talent. In Formula One, if there was one team who had the means to basically deny talent to the other teams, they would do it. And I'm sure it happens already. I'm sure there's people like going out and getting engineers and maybe not having them as their chief engineer, but having them you know in the in the pit so at the very least especially because all these teams are basically based around silverstone most of them are that they can sort of almost deny the other teams that advancement and when i look at the cost cap that's one of the things that comes into my mind it stops teams from sort of stacking their benches i guess it would be the best way i could put it i I think yeah go on you should just get a really big gymnasium and have the team principals on one side and then everyone who works in formula one on the other side and you just go down the line and you pick pick teams who gets picked last Danny Lowe, standing there sadly at the end <laughs> Aww. uh yeah i mean like we're not gonna read this email but uh another listener uh Amur wrote in and you know basically hit on something i think is pretty fundamental to where f1 is at right now which is historically F1 is a European sport, and European sports are like, you got the money, spend it. Uh, Let's, you know, it's a fair fight in that you're all free to spend as much money to build as good a program as you can possibly afford, and anyone can do that. Uh, Whereas the American model is the sort of closed cartel league model, and then sort of a goal for parity so that the competition is always interesting within it. And Amir's point is, it was that, you know, where F1 is at right now is this weird hybrid where historically a lot of the sports impulses are toward this, like, God damn the cost. I'm going to go and, uh, you know, build the best (laughs) damn car and have the best damn drivers, but it's now owned by, by Americans. And it is increasingly being run with like an eye toward American sensibilities, the American cartel model of like, how do we make all of these organizations viable and keep them within shouting distance of each other? And I think make it so they can't just build the best damn thing they can. Sorry to interrupt. I, I think the yeah. the other artificial cost gap that existed before was the popularity of Formula One, where teams could only spend a certain amount without it just being stupid, like a waste of money. Whereas now F one is in this boom mode, so it's it's just it's like you know success breeds success. Let's throw as much money as possible at this thing because there's no way to lose. Um, so that also has to be factored in as to why we've sort of historically. While there have been teams that were more successful and had higher budgets, we didn't have anyone really just throw. I, I could be wrong. There, there might have been times in the nineties where that happened, and I wasn't aware. But it, it, it's at a different level now. You know, this, the amount of in money injection within sport just isn't something we're, we've been used to up until this point. All right, uh, Drew, you want to read this next one about uh, F one team YouTube content? Because we mentioned how we were enjoying the vowels uh videos from from williams you mentioned that and a couple yeah. of people wrote in uh mentioning that there's a lot of good stuff coming out of the teams in this area yeah so joseph writes uh while i was homesick leading up to this grand prix weekend i stumbled upon the aston martin youtube channel which has an incredible selection of behind the scenes uploads from the 2021 and 2022 season there are other playlists on the channel that cover 2023 Uh, The videos cover everything from how driver helmets are set up, tear-offs, mics, instantly, I want to watch those, (laughs) Uh, biometric sensors inside driver gloves, to full race weekends following different mechanics, engineers, and much, much more. That is cool. Okay. Um, 
most of the cool, uh, most of the cools, most of the videos start the Thursday or even Wednesday before the race weekend, getting everything set up through the Sunday breakdown. I've spent hours going through their archives and have been amazed at the exclusive footage provided by the Aston Martin team. Cool. Awesome. And jo- then Joseph uh, links two uh, playlists here uh, that I will include in the show notes. That's great. I would love to uh, watch all those. Yeah, I, I, check got, I got a lunch break. <laughs> Uh, The next letter comes from Ethan, who writes, Very interesting and exciting to hear about James Vowles doing a frank breakdown of the racing weekend on the Williams YouTube channel. I wasn't aware that he was doing it there, but I'm actually not surprised. He and the other team leads at Mercedes, James Allison, Mike Elliott, Andrew Shovelin, etc., have been doing that for years on the Mercedes YouTube channel, originally under the series Pure Pitwall, and more recently under the much more modest title of Race Debrief. Yes, much more boring. (laughs) Um, Honestly, this has been one of the biggest reasons I've become an unrepentant Mercedes fan over the years. Certainly, it's been very easy to like and root for Lewis, Valtteri, and George, but the fact that the team's YouTube presence is mostly focused on frank, often surprisingly transparent chats with the people in charge of building the car and running the team has been deeply endearing for me, especially as opposed to the more common ego-driven puff piece slash driver lifestyle stuff that most of the other teams run on their channels. And after years of having this wonderful peek into the thoughts of the folks behind the scenes, I'm honestly just as emotionally attached to them, maybe more, as I am to the traditional faces of the team, uh, the drivers in Total Wolf, that is. Indeed, I was really quite bummed when Vals left the team because I was sad that I would no longer, I was no longer going to get to hear his thoughts on races in this format. (laughs) That's amazing. That's great. It's like when you left Giant Bomb, you know, people were like, (laughs) oh man, I'm going to miss him on the Bombcast. Yeah. Um, And then I put out a like 10 minute video every month. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. But they were highly edited and very well produced. Thank you. Um, that's an interesting part of this I hadn't considered. I was watching uh, Lando Norris's YouTube channel recently because I wanted to see the behind the scenes of his, uh, you know, podium at Silverstone and all that sort of stuff. But that was kind of a bit more, you know, what I'm used to from young YouTuber kind of mm-hmm. lifestyle. Um, it's interesting that, like, considering the amount of F1 content I watch on YouTube, and it tends to be the more technical stuff, that I've never come across any. I just saved all these... Um, playlists that were put in the uh yeah yeah i i I think i haven't because i just assume that they are those puff pieces you know i just assume that it's not going to be worth my time um and it wasn't until someone wrote in and says hey or maybe it was even rob is like dude the vowels uh, the vowels verdict is good no it wasn't Um, but now i'm gonna check this out talking about vowels being really good when they were talking to him on the broadcast and i think you'd you you investigated after that but yeah yeah, it's like I figured, but I figured like he might just be one of those discursive guys who's like, I just love talking about F one in yeah. this way. But if, yeah, there's other teams that also have an eye for that sort of nerdy detail. Uh, suddenly, I'm very intrigued. I checked out one of the Aston Martin videos, and like, you know, is it kind of cool setting like seeing people set up a like mobile command center you know like three days before an event starts it is right like do you enjoy concert documentaries for like what goes into making this all happen yeah do you like interviews with the dude who like builds the entire set that's going to look completely different in two days yeah like it's it's kind of rad like talk to that guy um and it's like so this is this is cool like this is um there's there's a lot of good stuff that people have sent in and uh yeah, I feel like we'll get a lot from just keeping tabs on these on these YouTube channels. Uh, Elizabeth from NARM, a.k.a. Melbourne, Australia, writes, <laughs> I can't shake the feeling that Red Bull cars, despite being rocket ships in the hands of Verstappen, may actually be incredibly tricky cars to get the most out of. With Gasly, Albin, and now Perez, we've had three drivers in a row that have struggled, to, struggled deeply to keep close to Verstappen. Last year, Perez said the car had developed towards Verstappen's driving style and made him less comfortable in the car. Is it simply that Red Bull had made a car that fits Verstappen so perfectly that it doesn't suit anyone else? I think about the way Gasly went on to get great performance from the 21 Alpha Tori, the Albin from the Williams this year and last. They, along with Perez, are clearly capable of overperforming and underwhelming cars. Do you think Red Bull can, hand, can find their Botas, or are they doomed to having an inconsistent second driver? 
Also, it increasingly feels like Verstappen will retire by, if not before, the end of his contract in 2028. What does Red Bull do when the driver uh, they've tailored... Uh, what do, what does Red Bull do when the driver they've tailored their car to leaves? To that last point, the, uh, George Russell made a joke about he thinks a lot of Max's, like, I don't know if I'll stay in the sport, is kind of posturing for future contract negotiations and maybe yeah. the, you know keep up pressure on the people deciding the rules for 2026. I don't know that I do agree. I think he's always, like... He brings up the end of his career often enough for a guy his age that it's like weird to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I don't think, like for whatever reason, I think this is a guy who thinks about quitting F one way sooner than you would imagine. Uh, someone having that level of success, but that might be a generational thing, you know. And the NBA Adam Silver has talked about guys coming into the sport half burned out and not enjoying basketball as much as players twenty years ago were. Right. To the point about Red Bull car development. This has always been a theory, I think, of like, what is what is the difference? And part of it is that Max is clearly a special driver and a really difficult yardstick to to measure against. Mm. But there has also always been the sense that his driving style is really specific and val- and places a premium on certain driving dynamics that other drivers don't really get on with. And Red Bull will consistently put its chips down on Max because he brings the returns. And so they're not going to split development to make their second driver as comfortable. I I fundamentally think there's something to that. I think there, I think there is, there is some sort of X factor to Max in that car uh, that has made it challenging for other drivers in the same, uh, you know, who are ostensibly, dri- ostensibly driving the same car. I also do think, and we have a question about Albin a little bit later, but I think maybe the other big X factor is the pressure. Like, I, I, I think Red Bull, being in the Red Bull F1 team, might be a different experience of being an F1 race driver than yeah. just about anywhere else. And maybe it's easier for that, you know, it's easier for the you know most talented driver in f1 history who is the number one driver to deal with that pressure than it is for any number two that's there i i I think a lot of this stuff is very like presented as binary but it's probably somewhere in the middle i imagine you know verstappen's clearly uh, just a terrific talent um it also makes complete sense that if you had that type of talent, you would bend the car in the direction of that yeah. person, especially if they'd been with you since a really um, young age. One thing I would like to posit is that if, since Verstappen has been in the team, Red Bull have always sort of had a number two in that other seat. And that wasn't always the case. Um, and it's not always the case at other teams. You know, when... Hamilton and Rosberg were both at Mercedes. There was no, you know, obvious number two going on there. Um, when Vettel and Weber were at Red Bull, you know, there are scenarios where the teams can be a bit more aggressive with who they want in that number two. And, you know, it's not a case of allowing them to fight or anything like that. But, like, when they were getting Sergio Perez, they weren't getting someone they thought could beat Max to championships. You know what I mean? They weren't aggressively going after some new young driver who they were going to course. Like they they haven't had those drivers. And I I, I would also like argue that, you know, a lot of the development drivers <clears throat> in Red Bull kind of aren't that driver either. Uh, you know, be it AlphaTauri or some of the folks we see coming up from F2, like you know, they could have tried to get um Leclerc, you know what I mean? Like if they, if if there was a means, signs is another one. There's plenty of drivers who come up who have the ability, I think, to to battle for championships, but they've decided not to. So, in a way, I feel like the issue has always been that there's been it's been close enough that they haven't been able to get the constructors. And Checo is having a bit of a mare at the moment, which really isn't helping them, considering how far and away their car is. But I also, I just don't think Red Bull wants that to a certain extent. I don't think they really want to have somebody who can really cause him problems, you know? Yeah, I don't think you want to kill your golden goose well, like that, right? Historically, I bet if you looked at it, what happens is one of those 
drivers leaves. So if you yeah. want to have a sustainable team, you kind of maybe that's the way to do it. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just saying that like when we look at these drivers, that's something to to maybe consider. Well, I guess two data points here. Um, one, the uh, the one I, I've mentioned a, a number of times on the podcast is there was a, an interview with Alex Albon um, about this. You know, do they develop or what's what's what was the Red Bull like to drive? And he basically said like, yeah, oh yeah, it's it's <laughs> developed it around Max. Um, but he his analogy was. It's like playing Call of Duty with the sensitivity turned all the way to maximum. Right, yeah. Like, it's apparently a very pointy car, as they say, like, very sensitive and might, in you know, as we were saying earlier, you know, this might be why Ricardo was able to get in the car at that testing day and then do really competitive laps. Uh, because if he is all about corner entry, same thing. Like, right. if you turn the wheel here, like, the car is uh, prone to oversteer. Um, so time, time will tell. I imagine that Ricardo starts to look like the perfect number two for that. Not only that reason, but also because he's been there before. It feels like he's been given a second chance. So it's all gravy from here. Uh, he's been Max Verstappen's teammate before when they didn't have a number one and number two driver. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, it's not like Max was wiping the floor with Ricardo. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I think, I think it's, Clear to me that this is their long-term goal. Well, I take this next one. Yep. All right. Uh, with, each week, <clears throat> with each week, I keep wondering why Ferrari hold on to an underperforming Leclerc when it's obvious uh, that the fourth best driver could be had easily in Albon. For clarity, the three I rate higher are Max, Alonso, and Hamilton. Yeah. Uh, Albon performs across the entire weekend in a car that is worse on the grid and is scoring points consistently. He doesn't make mistakes that could cost him an early seat at Red Bull anymore. And he always comes across as a marketable to the extent it matters to a front runner. And if we're comparing apples to apples, he's done more this season than Russell did the season before he moved into the Mercedes. My question Ooh, yeah. My question is, what more does he have to do to escape the back markers to get a better ride? Uh, I don't have a name with that email. Um, we'll we'll maybe try and see if we can grab that. Um, yeah, I feel like uh, I don't know. I th it's it's very difficult to compare drivers in those types of cars with the expectation that's required of someone in Ferrari. I mean, the reason why they don't is they gave him a massive contract. And he is this sort of, the possibility of being this big... It's coming up, though. ...generation time. Who, Leclerc's? Yeah. Well, how long was it? Was it a five-year? Yeah. I guess yeah, it is coming up. About five years. <laughs> we talked about this, like, I think... You're kidding. Uh, the start of the year, it's coming up fast. I think it's... Oh, my God. The last, I think next year might be the final year of that contract. Just ruined our brains. Yeah, I get, I, you know, I, I don't think fast decisions are made that way. I also don't think, I really like Alexander Albon, but I suspect that Leclerc is far more marketable in parts of Europe. Uh, just, you know, being European and, you know, monolinguistic and all that sort of stuff with, with that down in that territory. And he's a very, like, sort of, he's a real French looking dude, I think, which also helps when you're trying to sell clothes and stuff like that, you know, not to be crass about it, but like, when it comes to the marketing side of things, I think Leclerc is one of the Leclerc and Signs are some are some beautiful looking boys that I think a lot of brands like to get behind. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. What do you guys think? Is Leclerc underperforming in the Ferrari, or is the Ferrari underperforming? Yeah, I uh, I don't I don't know, but I I I think Leclerc. I haven't updated this spreadsheet that I keep in a while. Um, I think it's relatively current. Leclerc and Signs both their contracts are through 2024. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. God. The only other one I see on here that's, there's two that are longer. Norris is through 2025 and Verstappen is through 2028. Is Perez also through 2024. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Uh, Albon is at least 2024. It's unclear what the multi-year was. Oh yeah. So I'll just, I'll just say this in the, in the inbox. There's a little bit of like there are people people are getting people are catching Albin fever, and okay. also mm -hmm. there is a signs like partisans brigade out there in the oh. hills. That's like it is time for him to step into the light. It is time for Ferrari to recognize that uh, Carlos is like the steadier hand and the one who has more like Grand Prix championship medal uh, in right. him than than Leclerc. 
I think it's tough to judge anyone in the Ferrari. Like Ferrari, Ferrari's is how like I was thinking about this. Ferrari's in a nightmare situation for me because it feels like at like every part of the operation, I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure, you know, which of <laughs> yeah. these is like yeah. you want yeah. to eliminate a variable. You want to say, like, here is a thing yeah. that we can build on. Here's a stable, just change one like, thing. pillar. Hmm. And yeah, with with Ferrari, it feels like a super dynamic system where where all the all the variables are 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 tough to to isolate, and like even by one standard, it's tough to isolate. The the Albin thing. So, I think Albin's really marketable to a lot of people who probably listen to podcasts like this, where like Albin's a good kid, seems very mm. kind, level head on his shoulders. One of the critiques of him coming out of the Williams garage before the season started was he needs to have a bit more of that, like, I'm the lead driver edge to him. Uh, Which we've seen Lando of... develop in the past year. And it's not and it's not just a matter it, it like it like this was coming out of Williams again, like, you know, this is under Vols who doesn't seem to be running a, you know, shark shark infested waters over there. But the the argument coming out of some of the Williams folks is that this isn't just a subjective like, hey, I just want a guy who seems like a winner type thing. It is that having that little bit of edge, having that bit of I am excellent and I demand excellence around me can keep a team on its toes. Albin, at least at the start of the season, the, the sense was everyone likes him a lot, but has he proven he can be that guy? Drew. And I think it was this week that the, the – um, articles and, and quotes have started coming out of Williams that say like, yes, he can be that for yeah. us. Yeah. And so I think like he is kind of, he is kind of proving it out at Williams. Cause this was one of the big knocks on him. If you go back and you listen to his beyond the grid interview, it's a really fascinating interview because it, he is such an open guy and he is so frank about, he never expected to get the Red Bull opportunity. Uh, he didn't feel particularly ready for it. Didn't feel ever. It was a particularly great fit. Uh, and was like painfully shy and like retiring, uh, you know, for for where he found himself. And that was really at odds with what Red Bull kind of values. And that is speaking to the to the marketing thing, like to an extent, we, you know, ideally you'd want someone who wants kind of the fame and the attention and the pressure that, that comes with all this. Again, is is Albin that guy? And that question gets really pointed when you're talking about maybe promoting someone out of Williams to a marquee team. Because like we just talked about with Red Bull, Williams right now it's a it's a different vibe. It's a team like trying to sort of rebuild and like right now your team principles like my inventory management software is <laughs> borked. Uh, right. So you're you know the pressure is going to be different on a driver at that point because that's kind of where they are at. The minute it's okay, well we're going to give you a second chance now at a top team, a Red Bull, mm. a Mercedes, a Ferrari. That's going to be a completely different vibe. Last time he was facing that kind of pressure, Albin was maybe a little bit not ready for it. I still think the history of that man's career goes entirely different if Lewis Hamilton doesn't fire several <laughs> torpedoes broadside into yeah, it through a series of sketchy court oh. decisions in, in contested yep. corners. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, I think they're, they're like – there would be a bit of once bitten twice shy with promoting him into a, uh, a marquee team. But that being said, I can, you know, you can point to a lot of these teams and they are, they have questions now about what does our future look like? Who's our guy? Well, uh, someone else has some questions. Should I take this next email? Absolutely. This is from Maria <laughs> <clears throat> who writes big fan of the podcast. Thank you, Maria. I had a crazy theory that started forming in my head after listening to your podcast the other week where you talked about James Vowles discussing how much Williams needs a database for organizing and cataloging parts. It made me start thinking about all the various systems and technologies the teams must use for modeling the car's performance and things like race strategy. This led me to the thought, what if Ferrari's race modeling software is outdated or there is a lag with it? The more I thought about this, the more likely it seemed, and I started thinking of all the instances where it seemed like the Ferrari pit wall seemed like they were not taking into account or seeing what was happening live in front of them. Examples I thought of, having drivers released into traffic after a pit stop, multiple incidents of impeding coming from both drivers where the pit wall could have told them another driver was coming up on a fast lap, 
not factoring into account the tires on their car's actual performance during the race that is happening, and if it is different than was expected, not taking into account how tire temp tire types are performing on other teams' cars during the race, drivers forgetting what plan B is, <laughs> looking at you signs. It seems like whenever Ferrari has to make live in-the-moment decisions, they always blunder and never listen to the drivers when they give in-the-moment feedback. I could be grasping at straws here, but I cannot think of any other rational reason for the strategy chaos at Ferrari. I'm not familiar with any of the tech involved in race modeling. I'd love to hear any thoughts or insights you have on this. Thanks so much for your wonderful commentary. It is an essential part of any race week for me. Thank you, Maria. My um, uh, Go for it, Andy. My one question would be, has Maria seen Ford versus Ferrari? Because her you reading that email reminded me of, wasn't there a scene where... Carl Shelby goes to Ferrari and like everything is like super archaic. Or isn't isn't there like something where like they're not using any modern I forget what it was, but that was the do you remember that scene? No, it's like the scene earlier when they talk about the acquisition. I want to say one of the like the guys who's like running point for the acquisition for Ford is going through the factory and he's like uh, you know, uh, Molto, looking at dudes like hand tuning engines and such. Like, oh, that's appreciates what it was. the craftsmanship of it, but it is like you go into a dude's shed and he's building your <laughs> right. next Ferrari engine. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, you know, obviously that's not what's going on at Ferrari these days, but um, yeah, I, I mean, I, there, there could be a bit of a, you know, sort of a, a, a logic bias happening here with like, oh, that would explain all of these things, not like culturally or institutionally, they just have like these weak elements here or there. Um. I often wonder, and this is probably like a very European perspective, and we probably all have our own little biases in different pockets of Europe about how we think certain countries run things. Italy, to me, is not necessarily an IT powerhouse in in my sort of uh, experience with the country. There are plenty of them. You know, Germany, for instance, of course. Um, uh, and then... I also wonder, you know, we were talking about it before about how so many of these teams are based around Silverstone, right? So you have this big pool of, um, you know, experience and a labor market that's active there around this culture of racing. I wonder if Ferrari just by virtue of their geographical location and the language that's generally spoken there, and they're very proud Italians, I wonder if that just means that the pool of people they have access to, and perhaps in a way the software that they're using, is just that little bit more constrained. I, I have no idea, but like that that comes to mind, you know? Yeah, I, I think what my hypothesis would be sort of on the lines of what you were saying about sort of an institutional thing. I, I, I can envision a scenario where, you know, unlike a team that maybe um, relies entirely on, uh, you know, data or automatic decisions, you know, things like that, it, it might be done by feel, right? Or it might all have to run through one guy. You know, mm. I, I have a feeling that Ferrari, the way that I've seen some quotes about how that company runs is very stratified and like, um, uh, you know, has a chain of command, right? And so I could I can imagine like a lot of stuff coming up, you know, for, uh, or a lot of data presented to one person and then them making a decision, right? Instead of like distributing that load, yeah. I don't know. So the thing is, I don't know how bespoke the software that the F1 teams use actually is but mm. it wouldn't surprise me if a lot of them have a or or a lot of them tend to have a bit of not invented here bias like yes there's some things you're going to be taking in like you're going to be getting the fia's timing and scoring data you're going to take in that data they have access to the same uh live circuit maps that you do through f1 tv they're, they're going to get that data what thing works like an off-the-rack solution that you go to a company that, like, special, like, a bit like, you know, Brembo does breaks for a ton of teams, and it's just, like, it's the different break for, for each specific team? Or is it a thing where, like, no, we're going to sort of design what our software needs are and how we want it to work, and you come out with different solutions? Because I could, like, I don't know if this is the case, but I could easily imagine, like, 
it's good enough. It works. It's reasonably reliable. But if it is just always that little bit of jank, these things crop up in weird places. I remember uh, there was like a U.S. destroyer that was struck by a ship uh, off Japan in like a, a, tra- a container ship uh, off the coast of Japan uh, a few years ago. And it was like one of those really avoidable accidents. Lots of people were, were killed aboard that ship. But one of the things that emerged from it was it was a really advanced destroyer and it just gotten, a, I think, a radar upgrade. But the software didn't work, and so the radar operators, to sort of scan the surface around the ship, had to keep literally turning the radar, like, the entire console, off and then on. Effectively hard, like, resetting it between each radar sweep. Wow. It was good enough under most occasions, but it introduced, like, a certain lag. Like, they were looking at a series of still frames of their environment and not, like, a live picture. And I could easily imagine, like... F1 teams ending up in a situation where does the software work? Yes. Does it end up just putting you just a tiny little bit out of sync with the like speed of the the events unfolding for you? I could also see that. I'm really curious about like where F1 race team software originates from, what the what mm. the approach is. Yeah, is it all third-party vendors that, you know, tune this stuff for everyone? You know, I, I can imagine that, especially when there's so many teams and they're all willing to pay money for it. Or is some of this stuff in house? Like, I, 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 until we know that, this is all just hypotheses. But like, it's it is super interesting, isn't it? Like, I kind of ho- I kind of wonder if some of these YouTube links we've heard about earlier actually give us a little bit of insight into some of that, maybe. Or yeah, or um, I wonder if Caterham's laptops are still on eBay. <laughs> well, and exactly. like you hear stories about uh, like to get some of the old uh, like '90s F1 cars going. You gotta find like a computer with the Windows three point one install You're of kidding. that yes. software still on it. Oh my god! Uh, because that is like that's part of what makes the car go. Uh, so you you get that bit of um, you know, in The Martian where they have to go find <laughs> the old like Mar like Mars robot missions guys to talk about like how it worked. You get a bit of that with with F one. I could I could I could just imagine like, you know. <laughs> People getting going down GitHub rabbit holes to get their F1 team <laughs> software right. This only runs on the Amiga. Oh, man. Uh, now we're talking. All right. Shift F1 podcast at gmail.com or F1.cool slash emails. Of course, you can send us a link through a form if you like. Ooh. Uh, you can also hit us up on the socials using the links in the show notes. That's us around the internet. Should we take it around the world, Danny? Let's race around the world. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. A little minor key there. I like Thank the, you. Um, we are in Tartu for the World Rally Championship Rally Estonia. Oh, I thought it was Tortuga, the Pirates Tortuga. of the Caribbean. Yeah, we're yeah. racing frigates. Love it. Barks. <laughs> uh, Formula 2 and Formula 3 are supporting Formula 1 this weekend in Budapest, Hungary at the Hungara Ring. Woo. We have the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship at Lime Rock Park in Lakeville, Connecticut. Hell for yeah. the FCP Euro Northeast GP. You going, Rob? I'm regretting not going now. But, you know, who knows? It'll probably be hot and humid and miserable. True. Uh, we have the NASCAR Xfinity Series uh, at the Pocono Raceway, the Tricky Triangle, uh, <laughs> for the Explore the Pocono Mountains 225 you know, if That's they right. really wanted them to explore the Pocono Mountains, they'd have them race around the Pocono Mountains. Let's do point-to-point NASCAR. Yep. Or trucks. Was that what that was? Trucks? Uh, that what? was Xfinity Both. Series. Xfinity Series. The Craftsman Trucks are also at Pocono for the CRC Bracklean. My darling Bracklean. Oh, my darling. 150. Uh, what else we got here? Uh, the Motocross Grand Prix Monster Energy MXGP of Flanders. Ooh, Belgium. Watch out for the craters, what? fellas. Maybe, oh my God, is Watch. that what the Motocross Grand... Are they racing on the craters? Watch are out for the Leftorium. Am I right? That's a Simpsons reference. <laughs> Flanders. Get it? Yeah. I was going World War I. I'll be here all yeah, redlining, probably a, redlining a, through the Zone Rouge. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. We also have the IndyCar High V Homefront 250. Watch out. The North Koreans are coming to Iowa. 
<laughs> I get that. Iowa I get Raceway. that reference. Thank you. Thank you. Video games. That's, That's good. Right. I saw that. Remember we were talking about Crayon last week? Uh-huh. I saw that logo a lot because I watched that NASCAR. It was a good NASCAR. It was good fun. Yeah. Good indie on the how weekend, they, too. How they say it? They say crayon. crayon. They say crayon. crayon. We say crayon for like a crayon for like drawing with one of mm-hmm. those. That's a crayon. You say mm-hmm. crayon, right? I say crayon. We yeah, say there's, crayon. There's subtly two syllables there. Crayon. And it's certainly not the thing that a king puts on his head. No. Uh, Unless the FIA the world rally crayon land. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the World Rally Cross Championship is at uh, Lydon Hill Race Circuit in Wooden, Ooh. Canterbury. Wooden. Oh, Lydon Hill. If in you Wooden. couldn't fi- f- figure that out, it's the World Rally Cross of the United Kingdom. Here we got NASCAR. Pocono, baby. Tricky triangle. Let's go. My favorite. What's your favorite triangle? Isosceles. Mine's <laughs> tricky. Mine's the High Point 400. High point. High point dot com. What's that? Are, are we still talking about triangles? I wonder. Yeah, high, that's a good. That's some. That's a good integration. What's highpoint.com? Should I put a <laughs> safe search on? Highpoint.com. Uh, Doesn't load. Must great. be spelling it wrong. I forgot. I forgot to forgot to pay their <laughs> their domain registry. They did. Uh, Formula One also is on this weekend. Maybe you've heard of it. Ooh. Uh, the weekend kicks off Friday, July 21st at 7.30 a.m. Eastern Time on ESPN2. That's when Free Practice 1 is, followed by Free Practice 2 at 11 a.m., also on ESPN2. Saturday, July 22nd, Free Practice 3 at 6.30 a.m. Eastern on ESPN2, followed by Qualifying at 10 a.m. on ESPN. And the race, everyone, Sunday, July 23rd at 9 a.m. Eastern on ESPN. Woo! But that's what's going on this weekend. What's going on today, Danny, in history? Today in the past, the F1 Circus was at Silverstone in 1975 for the British Grand Prix. Before the race, Graham Hill announced his retirement from driving after a stellar career, including a then-record 176 GPs and two world championships. He is the only man in history to have won the Triple Crown of Motorsport, defined as the Le Mans 24-hour, the Indianapolis 500, and either the F1 World Championship or the Monaco Grand Prix. Hill had it under either definition. The race itself was a chaotic affair that saw 16 runners crash out in wet conditions, many at Club Corner, which created a pileup of F1 cars. No sooner had one driver jumped out of his car than another was sliding into it. The race was red flagged and Emerson Fittipaldi declared the winner with just six other cars still running. (laughs) Could you imagine? Could you imagine? It was the double world champion's last ever F1 win. What an absolute... I was thinking earlier about if Latifi had (laughs) retired after that Abu Dhabi, that might have been the worst race to retire out of. Um, Honestly, Everson Fittipaldi winning a race of seven cars is one of the funniest (laughs) things I've ever heard of. That sounds great. Tell him. I mean, you go back and watch some of those old races on the <laughs> F1 TV archive, and they're just like half the field regularly fails to finish. Yeah. It's just, you know, oh, well, there, there goes the leader. I guess th- this race is completely turned get, on its head now. Get in the spare car. Get- <laughs> yeah, right. See, this, is why, this is why F1 stats are basically meaningless. Yes. It's like, who's the best of all time? I don't know, man. Back in those days, your, t- your tire would just like roll away from you sometimes going around a corner. <laughs> Check out the uh, British Grand Prix in 75 on uh, the F1 archive if you want to see that madness. I might go watch that tonight, actually. That sounds like a good time. I wonder I wonder if it's there. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, final thoughts, Danny, ahead of the Hungarian Grand Prix. Hungarian Grand Prix is always a good time. Uh, Spa frequently is, too. So, uh, you know, stay out of the sun. Put the air conditioning on. If you don't have that, just open up some windows. Enjoy some racing this weekend and the next weekend, because then we got that we got that summer break. It's going to be slim pickings for a little while. Uh, so yeah, hopefully it's a good race this week in Hungara. Mm-hmm. Final thoughts, Rob. What if Danny does really, really well though? Oh the man, Danny Ricardo Ooh. hype train Ooh. like t- takes off. It leaves the station uh, <laughs> as we good. head into summer break. We did have a... Who got a podium here? No, who won here? Was it Gasly won here? 
We had a we had a Gasly only hungry? won at, Mon- at Monza. No, that was Monza. Who won here? Somebody won here that was that was odd. And I, I don't I for- recall. It was two years ago. I forget it was. It's late. It's late here. I forget it was. Was it Ocon? Did Ocon win? Was here? this Ocon's win? I think that sounds right. Yeah, that sounds right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. What if? Uh, yeah, it's it's happened before. If he gets a podium, I mean, what 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 would be crazy if he gets a point? If he gets in the top ten, that'd be stellar. That'd be pretty crazy. Yeah. All right. Wait and see. Well, if you'd like to support the show and get access to all of our bonus episodes and the official Shift F1 Discord, you can do so over at patreon.com slash Shift F1. Have a great week, race weekend, everyone. And we will see you all next week. Mm-hmm.